Hey, 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 everybody. I just wanted to uh, take a second here to announce the section that we're going to be talking about today, Abusing Smart Cities in the Dark Age of Modern Mobility. This is an especially interesting topic for me as I live in a city that is still stuck in the dark ages in Texas. I also want you to be aware of the fact that we've got full Mateo redundancy in this presentation, with not one, but two of them, in case one of them breaks. So I'm going to turn it over to them. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you for your time. We are going to steal you just one hour, so. OK. Um, I'm Matteo, Matteo, the one Matteo, Matteo Beccaro. Uh, I work as a, in the security field as a CTO of a small company in Italy, and we do offensive physical security. Uh, that's my Twitter, and if you want to just give feedback at the end of the talk, I'd be happy to, re to reply to that. And there's me. I'm uh, Matteo Collura, and uh, I got a bachelor just two weeks ago, and I'm still a student studying now in the field of nanotechnologies uh, for ICTs. So uh, if you want my Twitter as well, you find here my personal information. And uh, <clears throat> starting from May, we are uh, with Opposing Force, a uh, member of Securing Smart Cities, which is a non-profit organization which helps uh, decision maker to consider also security issues when implementing new solutions. And um, I will give the, the speech to my friend that will start illustrating what we did. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. Uh, we start giving a little overview about what a smart city is. Then we focus on a transportation system, smart transportation system. And what we want to do is like introduce a methodology for assess those kind of systems. And doing so, we also have uh, three different case studies, one for uh, each uh, infrastructure in a smart transportation system. And we, we apply our method to these, uh, to these case studies. And then we see what's up next. So let's start with uh, what is a smart cities. So a smart cities is usually composed by several uh, critical infrastructure, as for example, um, you know, energy management, surveillance systems, water management, transportation system, and waste management. So for a city to be called smart, usually those infrastructures have to be connected in some way. They can be connected to some central system or connected to each other to communicate and you know, better manage the resources. Uh, in this presentation, we are going to focus on uh, transportation system. So let's focus on smart transportation system. And the uh, smart transportation system itself is divided in uh, several infrastructure. And we may have traffic control, we may have a smart parking system, we may have a street light, smart street lighting systems and public transportation systems. So it's pretty complicated to work in this kind of environment because we have multiple layers, multiple infrastructure, each one communicate with the others in uh, unknown protocols. So what we are doing is trying to define a method to assess the system to better, to easily do it, do it so because that's what we do for jobs, so we have to, you know, do it as quickly as possible and the best way we can. So let's see quickly how the smart transportation system is usually composed. We have two methods, uh, sorry, two different kind of systems. The first one, uh, in which every element, so for example, uh, traffic system, traffic control system, smart lighting control, smart parking and transportation, communicates with uh, some central system. Each central system then communicate to a more central system. And that central system uh, aggregate the data from all the other systems and communicate information, usually useful information, to the citizen. Like, with what, she, what is the best road to go to work? Where is the more, uh, where is the left traffic today? And so on. And, uh, another kind of system is where each of the macro system uh, communicates directly to the user and sometimes also directly to each other. So there is no need of a more central control system. Uh, usually the, the central point of a smart city is always the citizen. So all the infrastructure are thought to be helpful to the citizen. 
Okay, let's go even more in details. So, smart transportation system. We have private transport, shared transport, and public transport. With the private transport, we mean like smart parking. With the public transport, we mean metro, bus, tram, trains, you call it. And with shared transport, we mean the new transportation economy like bike sharing, car sharing, etc. I drink a lot, so sorry for these interruptions. Okay, that's one of the method, one of the architecture we use to assess the system. So we try to re reduce every infrastructure to this schema in which we have uh, an edge domain and inside the edge domain there is the edge device uh, that take data from the physical world and send this raw data to a cloud domain. The cloud domain is like the brain of our system and it you know, analyze the data and send command back to the to device or send information to the client domain, which can be like mobile application for the citizen and etc. So the communication usually is always bilateral. So the edge devices can both uh, send, the, send, send data and receive commands. So they can act properly about the data they are sending. So for example, if there is no traffic, the traffic light is always green. Okay, that's uh, our first, that's a little bit introduction. Now let's go to our first case study, a smart parking meter system. Um, we will show some vulnerabilities about that. Okay, that's the device. Um, let's make a little bit of introduction about how the device work. Uh, so the device is um, both by the user uh, at some shop and then the device can be recharged so you can store credit on the device and you can do it uh, on both online uh, from your home so you connect the device to your computer register on the website of the of the of the company and then using your credit card or paypal or whatever you can charge credit on the device that can be used later or you can do the same procedure at some uh, com at some shops so you go to the shops, you gave the device, you pay in cash, and the, and the guy can charge, you, can charge your device. So, uh, once, once the device has some credit, you, you can park your, your car and then turn on the device. The, you then have to select the proper location because this device is available for more than 40 cities in Italy. Actually, I, didn't, I shouldn't say Italy, okay. In more than 40 cities worldwide. And, it, and it's growing. So you have to select the, the correct cities because each, each city has a different fare zone. So, and once the, you select the city, you have to select the proper uh, fare zone and activate the device. For, for, then, uh, for now on, uh, every minute, uh, every second, sorry, the device automatically calculates the, the fee you are paying and reduce that amount from your, from your credit. So actually the benefit for the user is that the user doesn't have to bring like coins and cash to pay the, the park, the parking, and he just get he just pay for the exact time is is parking and not for like half an hour uh, or one hour over. So these are some of the interfaces we found on the device. So there is a display port which is for uh, showing some information we will see later. There is the USB port which is used to connect the device through the so-called gateway, which is our computer that uh, connects the device to the cloud system. And then we have our, our MCU. Um, all those interfaces uh, have some vulnerabilities. We will show them uh, in a few. I just need to drink again. At DEF CON there is, um, I would say, the first time you speak at DEF CON they usually bring you shots of alcohol. They didn't do that this uh, easier. I don't know why. This is, uh, Yourself. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the first analysis we pr we did on the on the device was a firmware analysis, in which we found that there were no integrity checks, 
The, the firmware can be easily obtained in two different methods. We can intercept the communication between the gateway, so our PC, and the backend system during an uh, OTA update. So we can intercept the firmware, or we can extract the firmware directly from the MCU. Uh, in both cases, uh, the, 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 um, the unpacking the, the firmware was easy. And no integrity checks were present, no encryption in the firmware were present, no obfuscation, and no uh, authenticity is, is also, authenticity checks is present during the firmware upgrade analysis. So the result is that attacker can upload a malicious firmware, for example, removing the reducing of the credits part. So you can turn on the device, the device acts as uh, it always been, but at the, end of the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, you have always the same credit on the device. As I said before, there is some uh, debug interface. <coughs> Sorry, there is some debugging interfaces present on the on the device. We use the JTAG port and the SWD port to extract, for example, the firmware. Uh, there are also other debug traces uh, for all the components. So for each component present on the device, you can actually un intercept the data, uh, exchange it, and in inject other data. So let's try to reconduce our, our device to the schema I showed you before. So for the edge domain, we have the parking meter, which is connected via USB to our gateway and to the cloud domain. Uh, the cloud appliance is used for like remote charging the device to create invoice based on uh, where you park and how time you, how time you park, for example, for expensive for the company, etc., and to do OTA updates. So the cloud domain then communicates to a client application, which is uh, gave to the inspectors. Uh, the inspector can use the application to check if you are paying the correct fee for your staying, if you are paying correctly. Um, another thing, the inspector can, the, usually the inspector check if you are paying correctly just by looking at the display of the device. But there is also an NFC interface uh, that, the use, that the inspector can, can use to access uh, memory of the, on the device. So we did an, a communication security analysis and the result where that there is no data validation between the edge, edge device and the cloud domain. So we can both modify the data sent from the cloud to the, to the device and to the, the, from the device to the cloud. And moreover, the, all the trust in the, if you are paying or not, is in the device itself. So the inspector can actually check only if you are paying by looking the device or accessing the memory on the device. You cannot check if you are paying correctly uh, using the cloud, the, the cloud data. Because the device is not, it's not updating its status in real time. So as I said, there is no, no integrity check, no encryption, no authenticity checks. So this is a sample uh, request we, we intercepted. And from that you can see, I don't know if you can see, but it's there is some parameters which are very useful, and this is a configuration file. So every time you connect your device to the, to the gateway, uh, the, the cloud appliance send new configuration files for updating like fee zones, etc. Uh, if there are any new cities, uh, and we can modify that configuration file. Okay, so reversing the, the firmware, analyzing the communication, and uh, using some uh, the bug interface to understand better the data, we finally found what is the formula used by the device to calculate the fee. That's the formula. So we have the price per time unit, then we have the fair frequency, because in some cities you, you may have um, to pay every half an hour and not an hour, so it's another parameter. Then we have the, time, the seconds uh, lapse from when you turn on the device, and then you divide every, all of this for one hour because usually it's one hour. And then we have to add the minimum fee because in some, park, uh, in some parking you have to pay at least uh, one hour of parking, even if you stay just for like 10 minutes. So, as I said before, when you turn on the device, the display shows you the price you are paying and the, ta the time you turn on the device. So those two parameters are actually displayed. So even if we modified the the configuration files, so we, conf for example, if we put at zero the price per time unit, that zero is displayed, it is, is displayed by the device. So the inspector can actually see you are, you are committing a fraud. So that's not good. The minimum fee in all the cities, 
at the moment are, is usually set to zero, so we don't have to care about that. So what's the only parameter we have to, to change to set the multiplication to zero? Because that's what we want. If we set the multiplication to zero, then our fee is zero. So if you can change the, the fair frequency to zero, all the, all the formula is then zero, so we don't pay anything. Even if the correct configuration files is displayed because price per time units, we just set the, the correct one and the, the second, we don't modify that. The fair frequency is not displayed, so we can change it easily to zero from the configuration file, so we intercept the configuration file, change the, the value to zero, and then the uh, old formula becomes zero. So that's why we call our formula our centogral. And using this vulnerability, this vulnerability is pretty easy to, to exploit. We actually wrote a little script that can allow you to like do everything automatically. So you can just plug the device to the computer and like, I don't know, maybe three or four seconds, uh, your device is like every city present in Italy or not, uh, actually you pay zero for parking. Uh, moreover, we also develop a firmware which, in which uh, the, um, the fee payment is removed. So we display the correct uh, information, but we don't uh, remove the, the credits from the memory. So multiple vulnerabilities allow you to actually not pay for parking. That's a good thing, right? Okay, I'll now leave my word to my colleague, which will talk about the next two case study. Okay. Oops. Okay. Spoiler. Yeah, a little spoiler, but <laughs> um, we will go on speaking now about uh, shared transport, shared transportation systems, and in particular, we will speak about bike sharing. Well. Our case of study was divided into three steps, essentially. The first step is the one in which you go to the station where all the bikes are located and uh, you unlock yours. The second step is the funniest, you ride the bike. And the third one is when you lock it again and you walk away. So let's go step by step from the first one. The first one, um, so the picture shows that uh, the ways to unlock your bike are essentially two. Uh, the first one is, say, more physical. You need an NFC card, and um, the NFC card uh, will be checked. Here we will see how. Uh, will be checked and will unlock the bike. The other way to unlock is by using a mobile application on our mobile device. So. Um, the station is speaking with the cloud, or with the backend, that authorizes the unlocking of the bike. Let's see more in detail. This is one of the stations. And as you can see on the top, there is a NFC reader for the, for the card. And uh, as I said before, there are those two accessible methods in order to unlock the bike. Let's focus on the first one, so the mobile application. So at first we, we decompiled the app and we found that there is no obfuscation on the code and so that helped us a lot in order to understand how the whole procedure works. But moreover, one of the critical points is that there are the vendor credentials are coded and obviously we obfuscated them here because we don't want to say the name of any company here. And um, the, the critical point is that with those credentials, you are allowed to create new users, uh, charge some credits on those users, activate the users, and unlock a bike in real time, wherever it is. So it is quite dangerous, I mean. And moreover, uh, there are some APIs here and that are vulnerable to SQL injection. And uh, of course, for legal reasons, we did not make any attempt to exploit them. So I will skip this part. And 
There, is a, there, is, there is a private Q&A session later. <laughs> Let's move to the card analysis. Uh, okay, I hope you don't recognize the city, but um, it's, uh, okay. Let's go on, it's in Italy, but she said before. And that's it's not. my second, uh, <laughs> the second mistake. Okay, it's a ultralight uh, NFC card. So we all know that ultralight does not have any um, encrypted uh, data on it. Uh, well, uh, the protocol is not, um, is not encrypting the data inside, so each one can read it easily. And there is no authentication while uh, uh, reading the card. So if I can get one of those cards, I can easily read my, with my smartphone or another reader. And uh, the only identification uh, parameter in it, unique, uh, unique uh, identification parameter is the UID, which identifies one and only one user. So that is the sensible, all the sensible information relies in the UID to unlock the bike. And uh, if you look close to that card, just look inside that rectangle. I don't know if you see the, that number. Uh, please raise, raise your hand if you guess what that number is. Please do. Yes, you're right. It is the UID, but in reversed way. So don't know who, who decided to put in that place the UID. Well, of course, it is simple to read it by a reader, but and they ease you this procedure. Let's go further and analyze the, the other steps. Well, there is a physical issue we found in the stations because the only way the station um, is able to understand if the bike is properly locked or is inserted is by a, a sensor inside that uh, little piece of metal you see in the yeah, in the hole. And um, if you slightly remove the, the bike as soon as you unlocked, but just a few centimeters, um, if it, the distance is short, the sensor will not, well, the station is not going to understand that the bike has been removed. And so after a minute or 30 seconds, I don't remember, uh, the unlocking process goes in timeout. And uh, the station locks again the, the bike. The point is that the bike has slightly been unlocked, so the lock is not locking actually the bike. And uh, you can extract the bike and the uh, station will feel uh, as if the bike has not uh, been unlocked. And um, the point is that the central system can detect uh, this issue in two ways. Uh, the first one is that uh, you, you leave the bike in another station. So the central system will see, okay, I have the bike number one, two, three in station one and at the same time in station two. So there is something wrong. And uh, the other critical point is if there is another bike that is going to be uh, left in, in that station, the central system will uh, understand that there are two bikes in the same location. So it is actually a problem. And that's all for the shared transportation systems. And what about the public transportation systems? We defined uh, two different architectures. Uh, the first one we called the offline system because uh, each of the bus, metro, or tram, however, they, um, they are speaking with a backend and the backend is unilaterally speaking with a UID blacklist or a database which is uh, recording all the possible mm, tickets that are run out or banned, don't know. And uh, the other architecture is uh, we call the online system because the difference is that the UID blacklist can interact um, with the stamping machines that are located on the bus metro or whatever. So let's start with the, the first architecture. We spot out uh, two main vulnerabilities. The first one is called uh, lock attack. And um, actually, it's quite easy to be understood 
because the, the sector where the rights are located, that is the OTP one, can be made read-only if we set one bit in the lock bytes uh, to one. So it's quite easy hack, let's say, and uh, no rights will be removed when you stamp your ticket because it is read-only. So essentially it's quite easy also to be uh, fixed, this vulnerability, but uh, it will work essentially, well, it was working. And uh, the second one we are talking about is the time attack. And um, this is nicer because you don't have to make any, any modifications to the lock, set, lock sector and to the OTP. So you leave essentially all the rights as they were and you find uh, the place where the timestamp of the last, validate, uh, last validated ticket is stored. So the only, the only task is to reverse, uh, to reverse the timestamp and find the initial time uh, when the, they start counting the minutes. So as soon as we reverse the, those data, for example, here we, we put a rectangle, a red rectangle around the, that area and we found the initial date was something around 2005, I uh, don't remember. First January. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't say it loudly. And uh, we found that, and uh, so that way we are able to forge our, our own uh, timestamp and validate our ticket without touching the rights because the ticket is valid for some minutes, 90 minutes or whatever, and so you, you will have always a valid ticket. And uh, what about the online systems? Um, this, those kind of systems are not uh, vulnerable to the previous, but are vulnerable to the replay attack. Well, offline systems are also vulnerable to replay attack, but I will explain now. And re w by replay attack, you have a lot of possibilities and will be a serious problem. Because if you use some emulators or clone tickets, the one from China, for example, the, there are no rules. They act like a Mifair Ultralight, but they are not, or other Mifair, maybe classic, etc. but they are not following the standard rules and the protocols. They are completely erasable and changeable. So you are allowed to change the UID, forge new UIDs with a, a valid structure because you, have a, you can clone your ticket with a a valid structure, even if it is encrypted, you change the UAD and then you can stamp it and bypass any software encryption because the, the validating machine makes everything uh, by itself. And uh, moreover, you can also use the same ticket to, uh, you clone it on your clone one, you increase one ride and you stamp the clone one and then you come back to the the previous ticket, the original one, copying all the data sectors and whatever you have, so it will be perfectly um, indi indistingu uh, indistinguishable from the, the previous one. And it is valid. And the, pro the problem is that uh, the implementation of a whitelist would be a, a problem in our systems because the whitelist must, be, must up be updated on all the stamping machine in real time. Think about uh, if you go to buy a new ticket from a, a shop, that ticket must be usable immediately uh, as soon as you buy, you buy it. So the implementation of a whitelist is a serious problem and it will mean, well, you will need to uh, build a completely new infrastructure if you already deployed one to implement such a thing. So it will be a very, very difficult task. As regards future works, what's next? Well, we studied, uh, uh, this is the picture we, shown, we see before, and um, we spoke about uh, energy management, surveillance systems, water management, so let's start with uh, smart cities uh, surveillance. And those kind of cameras can be used for, multi well, they have multiple uses, one of those uses can be um, 
for policemen to charge people maybe uh, going with their car in uh, restricted areas, for example, limited traffic uh, areas, and they can uh, snap a picture of your, of your plate and uh, sending you a fine for entering that. But how, the, how is the connection made between those cameras and the main uh, backend? Well, we, we still have to understand how. And um, then we have something on water management. Maybe there are some counters that are revealing how much water each one of us is using and uh, um, applying a charge for each cube meter of water. I don't know if you use here those kind of units of measurements, but uh, the amount of water yeah, you need. Yeah, imperial is different from metric, but I hope it is clear the same way. And uh, so those kind of systems have to be interconnected between a central infrastructure that uh, uh, evaluates the right fee to be charged at each user. But what about, for example, the smart city lighting system? And uh, this way we are going to illustrate, for example, how the, the lighting for uh, a street maybe or some buildings, how to uh, save money in uh, turning on or off lights when, uh, when it is not uh, necessary. So uh, what, is the, what is the algorithm a central system can use to turn on or off those kind of lights? That it will be uh, a central point for future works. And finally, the smart traffic light system. Um, some new technologies about uh, making the green light last longer if the, the road is quite crowded and uh, maybe preventing from turning it red if uh, there is no car in the crossing road. And, uh, but if those uh, systems are interconnected and badly, let's say, say badly, and the connection is not secure, maybe a um, malintentioned user can turn the red on and, uh, well, the green on and the green on on the other side could be a mess. Yeah, the, yeah. there was a, a paper published by Cesar Cerudo about yeah. traffic system. You can check about that. It's yes. Interesting thing. On securing uh, smart Yeah, uh, securing smart cities. cities. Yeah. And finally, one of the, the what, okay, we can test all, all those infrastructure, but our final challenge would be hacking a whole city. Yeah. So, as you saw, we have like material for free or for DEF CON. So, <laughs> good. Well, you can see us in the next year, probably. Sure. And if you have some yeah, cities, suggest. you would recommend some cities to be hacked. Yeah, and we you are. Want to sponsor us, we are. Yeah, we exactly just need to play the flight. <laughs> a five-star hotel, and then we can work something out. No problem. Uh, you, you forgot the suite. Yeah, five-star. A suite in a five-star yeah. hotel, sorry. <laughs> One each. We don't share. <laughs> okay. Just to be clear. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so I think there is like something like 1,500 people now here. Any question? Don't be shy, come on. It's written, don't be shy. It's a Q&A session, there. okay. Uh, Do we have a microphone for? How does it work? Yeah. Goons, we need a microphone. Goons, not here. Ah, the microphone is here. Oh, okay, you have to come here. You have to do the work. So on a replay attack, rather than copying it to another device, couldn't you just copy it, make a gold image, and then after you've used it, replay that back onto the original device? Yeah, you, yep. you, you can do that, but the problem is uh, when you have the blacklist, uh, sometimes your ticket can, uh, can be put on the blacklist because it actually behaves in a not correct way. So what we did is to inject new UID so the system doesn't recognize if the, every time you stamp the ticket, you put a new ID. So the, this new ID has not pre, uh, previous behavior, so they don't ban it. Other question? Just stand up and go to the microphone.
No questions? Come on. <laughs> uh, we have like... Yeah, still more 10 or less. minutes. Yeah, so we won't go so anyway. Please ask. You have to stay inside. Close the doors. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have a question. Thank you. Um, it's for you, not for us. <laughs> for me or for you. I can talk after, it's fine. Thank you. Um, Singapore is having a real big surge with their smart nation. One of the things that they're doing is they're having a big push for, in the name of elder care, monitoring in the home. Are you seeing that in Europe? Uh, nope. At least not in Italy. Well, we are from Italy now. Maybe yeah. you have understand, yeah. understood that, but <laughs> not in Italy. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because we actually never thought about that, but um, we are going to present the, the same research in Singapore uh, next month at GSEC. No. Two yeah, weeks. this month. Two weeks. At the end of the month in GSEC. So maybe there's some like, interesting point to, to speak about. Can you tweet where you're doing this information? Because I live in Singapore. I like to attend. Uh, yeah. Okay, you can come yeah. later and give you the link and yeah. whatever. On the, on the parking meter charge hack, did you think to try making the charge negative? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, and, uh, something very weird happened. Yeah, we they, they charged us like ten times what what, what we owe. Oh. Yeah. So there there must be something more in that formula. <laughs> okay. Reversing the firmware, there is some uh, like very strange things, like some weird vulnerabilities in which you can like overflow the whole system and yeah. crash it. It's, but yes, we, we tried. Hi, so in Chicago we have a different bike share system with a different lock at the front of the bike, which I believe, uh, I'm not sure if this hack will work or not on it. So I'm wondering if you've looked into other hacks for bike share that aren't reliant on the locking mechanism. And then also our bikes have GPS, so have you figured out how to, if you wanted to literally steal the bike, how do you overcome the GPS? So, so you have a GPS on the bike? The bike. Okay, you, there was a, a talk, I think, last year at the Black Hat, mm. or DEF CON, or both, probably, uh, about spoofing GPS data with the SDR. So you can actually bring your SDR in a, in a backpack with a battery and, like, spoofing the data and, meanwhile, stealing, stealing the bike legally. <laughs> it's a, a, a principle we, we are trying also to apply to uh, car sharing because they check uh, your mileage and where are you going, and they charge money for that, so it's an interesting thing. You're welcome. Anyone else? Three minutes. Yeah. Maybe four. Or five. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your hour. Yeah. Thanks for... We really appreciate. Also, thanks for all our sponsors. And yeah, that's it.